So in, in this session, we, we want to pick up on some of the themes that we've just listened to. How conversations like this can be facilitated or triggered by, by just thinking differently, thinking outside the political box on occasions. And um, Neve will have heard me say this in Dublin back in November. I had seen that play previously, Those You Passed in the Street. It was, uh, it was performed in Carrickfergus. Uh, I'd been invited to chair a panel discussion after the play. And during the play, you could have heard a pin drop. There was absolute silence, around 200 people in the room. There was then a short break, and we come back to a conversation thereafter. And I thought the roof was going to come off the building. There was an explosion of emotions, explosion of anger in many sense. People felt that they hadn't been heard. They were being ignored. It was about our bonfires, it was about our flags, it was about our soldiers, it, it, it was about the other side getting everything. And that event happened in Carrickfergus. And um, to borrow the song and to rework it, I kind of thought, I wish I wasn't in Carrickfergus. That, 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 that's how I felt that night. I, I went home and I lay down in a dark room for, um, for a couple of days. But there were a number of people on the panel with me, um, including Barra McGrory, who had been the former director of public prosecutions, an assistant chief constable to the then victims commissioner. And they made, and Harold Good, the, the former Methodist president, was in the audience. And he said, we needed to hear that. We needed to hear that. So these conversations should never be comfortable. They should never be cozy. And people should feel able to say what they need to say. And I think that's part of our problem in terms of how we've addressed or not addressed the past, that we remember a number of things and we forget too many people. And when people believe they've been forgotten, then their hurt becomes greater. And I think what we heard from Ealing and Breeze yesterday and what we experienced in that moment yesterday is that when people are heard and when we listen to them and when they feel acknowledged, we can get to a better place. And, and that's what I think the challenge of the next steps are. I mean, John had asked about the UK legislation just as we finished the last session and what Una and, and Roger thought about amnesty. I think what we need to think about is how can we do this differently? How can we do it ourselves? How can we make things better? How can we make progress? And, and that's our opportunity in this session that we're about to, to have, to hear from Neve about the work of Glen Cree and how they create spaces uh, for, for dialogues and conversations such as this, to hear from David about his personal experience, and then to hear from you, um, your ideas and your thinking about how we try to step forward. So maybe Neve, I'll ask you for a, for a few thoughts, first of all, about the importance of the Glen Cree project, the importance of being able to create these type of stages and these moments where people feel able to talk. Thanks, Barney. Um, I suppose from Glen Cree's perspective, we were set up in 1974, as, as uh, some have mentioned, Barbara mentioned in the video, in response to the troubles in the north as a, as a, as a respite centre initially for people fleeing the violence um, up here. And out of that, those, those sessions, those, those residentials, the dialogue formed. Um, we've talked a lot about building relationships. So the opportunity to be together, to meet the other, um, has been extremely powerful and has always underpinned uh, our work in Glen Cree. As we're, we're teams of mediators and facilitators, it's about creating that safe space. Um, but also, as there's no, I suppose, one size fits all model for, for reconciliation, for work with victims and survivors, we don't take a one size fits all model to the work that we do. 
um, I think is testament to this, this program uh, so expertly run by Roisin. It is the, the detail, the, the, the groundwork, the, the, the one-on-one, the, the conversations, the preparation that leads up to people being comfortable coming into a room together. No surprises, um, No surprises, you know, and also managing people's expectations, Barney, um, you know, in terms of, of what they can come into the room. You, 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 sometimes you find people who they have a, a list of criteria, they have mm. certain ultimatums, um, and I suppose it, it's working through that and breaking that down that is, is so fundamental that they're, they're ready to listen, they're ready to hear different views. Um, you mentioned difficult conversations. It feels like all we have in Glencree sometimes are, are very difficult conversations, but it is so important to have a space where you can do that. Um, I suppose I, I'm particularly mindful of, of, of one example, uh, slightly outside of Northern Ireland, where we brought the victims of the Birmingham bombings to Glencree. And these are people who are largely ignored by their, their, their own government and felt very much at sea. A very diverse uh, group in terms of victim survivors wanting very different things. And it always st- stands out to me as, as quite a, a pivotal event um, in Glencree's victims and survivors work in the difference in when those people arrived. and not knowing what they were coming into. There was a good old sideways Irish rain coming mm-hmm. off the mountain and this old military barracks and you know what, what were they arriving to? And the transformation, I mean, Barbara and Will would have facilitated some of those sessions, but the transformation with those people from the beginning until the end of, of the weekend in, as was sharing their stories, being listened to. Um, we engaged with the British ambassador. Um, we engaged with, there were former combatants who were there as well. They met with Simon Colvin, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. They met with the, the Oireachtas Committee that, that uh, Fergus is um, chairing. They also were hosted by the President of Ireland and Oris and Uchtaran and had the opportunity to ring the peace bell. And it was so, so fundamental to them that they were acknowledged that some people who... I suppose uh, there was one lady in particular who I remember myself and Barbara kind of had noticed had maybe had something to say, but she she wasn't quite 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 ready to. And we did a little bit of kind of individual work with her in mm-hmm. the break between the sessions, and she shared things she'd never shared before that others within the group had had never shared. And there are many within the group who are still seeking justice, but for so many others. They, they got what they needed. It, it really helped transform them. And it is such a, a humble experience to, to witness that um, and to be part of that. And it's a responsibility that we take very seriously in Glen Cree. Um, you know, this is, we talk about solutions to the, the, the legacy issue. For the, those who are living with that loss, they live with that throughout their lives. But if we can give them some peace and some comfort mm. within that, that's a worthwhile endeavor. Mm. David, just on that importance of acknowledgement, being heard, being noticed, I suppose, um, what would you say on that? Yeah, um, well, the first thing I would say, I'm not quite sure why I'm sitting up here. I thought I was coming for a free lunch, but apparently there's no (laughs) such thing. Um, uh, Two two little things, uh, if I can just start with by way of kind of reflection from way back when um, you you were asking our our kind of experience. Uh, I went to Queen's in 1979 as a medical student. Uh, I was there a few months when one of my best friends was shot dead. He was a solicitor's apprentice delivering a a summons to a policeman, of all people, and the IRA mistook him for somebody else and shot him on the way out. Um, That was the first really bitter experience that I had of the Troubles. Um, Queen's was a difficult place in those days. Um, I was actively involved in the Christian Union, and I was chairman of their mission committee. And being a medical student, I was there a long time. So 83, 84, we had a mission plan for the year. And one of the events, well, the, the title for the mission, which is what prompts this little story, uh, was The Missing Peace. Um, now, it, for us, it was a pun on the word, and, and, and our motivation was, was to, to share the, the news about Jesus with people. Um, but one of the events that we ran in, in November of, of, of 83, um, which was largely um, my idea, and I really had to push hard to push, push it through, uh, was to run an event which we called The Missing Peace in Ireland. And we, had, we put together a panel, and we had a policeman's widow, we had an IRA man, we had a, a, an INLM man who'd been on hunger strike, and we had a man who uh, was uh, a, a UBF man who was still in prison when I was organizing the event. Uh, he promised me he would be on good behavior and he would be out for November. Um, I had a very prominent, I'll not mention his name, a very prominent Christian leader in Belfast uh, who had a very significant ministry around the, the city center and the, the university area. He's dead now, uh, but he was going to chair the meeting. 
Uh, two weeks before the meeting was to happen, he phoned me and said, Dave, I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. It's too dangerous. Um, the UCCF uh, staff worker stepped in, uh, a man called David Bruce, who has been the Presbyterian moderator for the last two years, and David chaired the meeting, and it was a remarkable event in what we called the McMorley Hall in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, later they renamed it the Mandela Hall, and now, of course, it's demolished. Um, but there must have been seven or 800 people packed into that event. Um, now, we were delighted because it meant more people were hearing the message you were trying to proclaim. But in terms of the politics of it, I didn't realize it at the time, how significant it was to have those group of people who shared a Christian faith, that was the purpose they were there. But coming from such a diverse background, it really struck a chord with so many uh, people. So that's one story. The other story, to balance that, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that we, we were engaging with some of those things, even, even if it was sort of tangentially or accidentally. The other story that I've often repeated is I had five years as a medical student, uh, and then I had three more years at Queen's as a theological student. And in eight years of study at university in Queen's, in Belfast, in the midst of the Troubles, I cannot remember one class, Now I always have to put a writer there, there were a few classes I fell asleep in, and there were a few that I missed, but I cannot remember one reference to the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual impact of the Troubles. Mm. Now, I remember vaguely uh, lectures about how to put titanium plates on the skulls of people whose heads were blown open. So there was a great deal of learning and talking and discussion about those kinds of things in Belfast in the, in the 70s and 80s, but there was no talk in either uh, medical education or theological education about the impact of the troubles. And so on the one hand, uh, the one story illustrates we, we were struggling with these things and, and there were some efforts, mm -hmm. but by and large, we didn't. And to come back to your question that you asked me about acknowledgement, uh, that's the key. If we, if we don't talk about these things, if we don't recognize um, people's physical and emotional and spiritual pain, uh, it's one thing to patch the skull up with a titanium plate. It's another thing to deal with what's inside that head mm. and inside that heart and we still struggle. Now, we're better than we were, and thanks to the Wave Trauma Center and their, uh, and their education program, uh, social workers, nurses, medical students, and so on, they got a big award for it recently. I just give a shout out to the, the folks there uh, at, at, at Wave in Queens. Uh, so that, th th those kind of students are getting some trauma training, and, some, and those things are being discussed now in a way that they weren't 30 um, years ago. But that the process of acknowledging that pain and that hurt uh, is still a work to be done and is key. And very important, yes. I'm going to take some further hostages now from, from the audience. So Kate, uh, put your pen down there for a moment <laughs> and make space for that microphone that someone's going to give you. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to pick up on something that David said about what we didn't discuss at the height of all of this. And I suppose what that was about, Kate, was how normal the conflict became. And to go back to something Roger said earlier, the peace became more difficult to police than the conflict. In, in my area of work, the peace became more difficult to report than conflict. And I suppose, Kate, what I'd like you to try to develop for us is, is where you think we need to go now in this story of the past, not in the political arguments over amnesty, but in terms of proper acknowledgement, proper recognition, minding people, that term that we quite often use. What, what is the, the stage beyond these types of conversation that, that we need to go to next? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was very struck when you were speaking there, David, and. Of, of talking to social workers and teachers who, who talk about doing truancy reports, you know, during the conflict and being told off if they mentioned, yeah, the kid wasn't here, but somebody was shot at the end of the street and there was rioting, or they were like, no, 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 that's, that doesn't go in the report. You just say um, <clears throat> the kid hasn't been at school, has been at school one day in, in two weeks. That, um, and so there's... It's, it's a nice um, parallel to what we need to do in terms of unpacking the ordinary lives um, that, that we lived through. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Roisin said it so well yesterday when, when she said we need to hear what people are saying and we don't need to 
agree with them. We need to understand where it's coming from. Of course. And we need to acknowledge that that's, um, that's really hard when we've, we've gone through a, a generational conflict. Um, when you asked earlier today, like, who's the enemy? Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of smiled to myself because I think, and you see this in other international conflicts too, the enemy isn't, isn't just the person, the community, the organization that, that you see. The bigger enemy is the person within your own community who either is, is a danger or is even accidentally, you know, I kind of explain to, to, um, to young people how we, we had a conflict where two people could be sitting at a bar and one of them says, oh, that lot are all useless. And the other one says, no, no, there's one of them works in our place, you know, you know called, called John. And um, two weeks later, somebody walks in and says, who's John, and shoots him. Um, and it's because that conversation has gone on that the risk was not, the risk could be even things said in good intent mm. could end up in, in harm. Mm. And we've got to, that's all built into us. And we've got to unpack all that so that hearing somebody else, talking to somebody else, actually can still feel dangerous mm. somewhere deep inside us. Mm -hmm. And it certainly, it can be dangerous when you present it to, to somebody else. Um, and, and there's an awful lot an awful lot of little dialogues, big dialogues that need added together to, to change that. Um, and I think it comes back to something that, that Julian, you know, I know you don't want me to talk about the bill, um, but that Julian um, emphasized, yes, Julian Smith emphasized yesterday, was that about working together. Um, and I mean, he called it consent. Um, sometimes it's not even consent, it's just that working together, which is the problem we're facing at the minute with a, a unilateral um, response. I suppose we work better together as a people than we do at a political level. And I, I suppose when I think about the bill, it is something that people are trying to impose on us. It's a solo run, it's a player in the conflict period doing it. And I always, I always notice their absence in, at events such as this. They're invited, but they don't come. And I suppose that asks the question, are they really interested in what people really think or are in a different opinion? I, I nodded at Kevin here to my left, uh, my next hostage. And um, Kevin and I grew up in East Belfast together. I was in the same class as his brother Fergus at school. Uh, we all were scattered out of East Belfast at the same time had to leave our homes. I lived in a house that was in a cage when we left it. We went to a small Catholic church in Sydenham at that stage. I remember the windows coming in during midnight mass. And it, it was something that you said, David, a moment ago, that I think in that period we just got on with it. We, you know, I don't remember any big discussions at a family level about all of that other than it had happened and we were now at the what next. And, you know, I was speaking to my sister just a couple of months ago, and she said, I thought we were going to die that night the church was attacked. Mm -hmm. She remembers the priest opening the door to go outside and thinking to herself as a child, why is he opening the door? But I think probably more about that today than I did in the early 1970s. And I was just wondering, Kevin, was that your experience? Was it your family experience? Was it something you thought deeply about then, or is it... Or is it something you think much more about now? It's Kevin Cooper. Well, the slight difference probably between us was I grew up in a working class community. My father was a full-time official. We, my mother was from Donegal, so we were a cross-border family. But we had, uh, my mother and father met during the Second World War. My mother was working for the Ministry of Defence believe it or not, because she and her sister had moved to Belfast to live with a great aunt off the Bloomfield Road. And the reason we ended up in East Belfast is when my mother and father married, there was no housing, it was during the Second World War. So they lived with my great aunt. Um, 
who was married to a German clockmaker, um, a Berenger. She, she was from a famous jeweler's family. Um, and so we grew up in, firstly, Ashland Park beside Icefield Boys School, and then Sydenham Gardens off the Hollywood Road. Not a, not a kick in the backside from that yes. little church that I described. Yeah. And what Barney and I spoke of yesterday morning was the number of families, which were very few Catholic families that lived in that immediate area. And we, we listed between us, I think, about a dozen families. Mm. And we all know, as in Barney and I, I mean, know different things that happened to all those families. Now, I also know, because of where I came from, where I grew up, my best friend in Ashman Park went on to become a commander in the UVF. I went to school in Hollywood, and I played football in Park Barracks. Your Palace Barracks at that stage. It was it's the well-known barracks for people to think of in the troubles where people were taken to be interrogated. But in those days, it was an open camp. Mm. We just walked onto the camp and played full and uh, played. In fact, we're at MI5, we probably mm -hmm. now have the building, yeah. football. So we played football with kids from the camp who were at school with us. And there was nothing unusual of that. But I do remember sectarianism existed because Icefield Boy or um, Sullivan Upper quite often would attack children from our school going to school. I can remember a famous incident when my brother, Aidan, who was older, got off a bus because we were invited off by grammar school boys. Uh, and he asked me not to come with them because we would have, as a family, acted as a family. Mm. Uh, he told me to bring the other kids to school. So I went off, brought the other kids to school. But I can remember a complaint from that school primary school boys had picked a fight mm. with this school. So this was my upbringing. But I went to, to secondary school in North Belfast, to Barney here. Barney is it's colloquially known as St. Patrick's. The people I went to school with became commanders in provision IRA and the official IRA. And I was viewed as a man from over the bridge there's no concept of someone from a Catholic background who could live in East Belfast. Of course. And this is, uh, you know, my, my mother and father continued to live in Sydney Gardens. My sister died uh, about five, six years ago. Uh, she continued to live in Sydney Gardens. Mm. But all the boys had to get out. Mm. When we came of age, we had to move. Mm. Uh, we first moved with the the grant that we used to get going to university mm -hmm. paid us to, to move into <laughs> student flats. And, and, and we only visited after that because it was not plainly safe yeah. for us as boys to be living in East Belfast. Uh, and my father's, the respect that my father had, the house was never attacked because he was well respected within the broader trade union movement in Northern Ireland. He, you know, my family history is legendary in the trade union movement. My father was president of the Belfast Straits Council. He was chair of RMR prison visitors. Uh, the WA was mentioned. He was the regional secretary of the WA. He left a man, a working class man, who left school at 14, but had a huge respect for education, huge respect. All us kids, even me who's dyslexic, went to third level education. And that was because of my father's belief in education is how working class people better themselves. They better themselves through working conditions in the trade union movement, but they better themselves through education. And everybody should have the chance to the, to the best of their ability to rise to that ability. So my understanding as a family was the people who were involved in these movements were involved because other people were pulling their chains. Mm. They were dragged in. Yes. Yeah. They weren't of that nature when I grew up with them. They became of that nature.
because others pulled their teeth. Part of the circumstance at that time. Kevin, thank you. I know that wasn't easy. And thank you very much for, for sharing that story with us. Um, is there anyone else? Uh, yeah, uh, Mich M sorry, oh, sorry, Michelle. No, it's not Michelle. She's, she's, she's just waving at me. Um, I'm going to go back to Una and Roger because we had, we had started a conversation just at the end of the last session. John had asked the, the question about the legislation, about amnesty, about immunity. And I know we walk in eggshells when we talk about those things. But is there a way, Roger, do you think, other than the political way of trying to make some progress on this issue? And I, I, I'd like Una to say a few words on it as well, if there's another mic available as well. If, if, Una's just at the back table here as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Barney. Uh, and thank you for uh, everybody's contribution so far. Uh, I think something has to be done because if you look at the sort of the academic literature and the practicalities of moving forward, you have to deal with the past. Otherwise, you're just leaving yourself open to issues in the future. And uh, it's how you deal with it in a sensitive way. It's how you, as I said before, there are, are victims and there are survivors and there's sort of discussions around the truth around justice, around reparation, although that's not a, a, a huge percentage, and about acknowledgement, which is increasingly a Key. big thing. Yeah, just people to acknowledge that what they did was wrong. Uh, I think up to date, we have, as I said before, a piecemeal approach to it. I think if you look at policing, we have the Ombudsman's report. We have had different commissions looking at policing. We have had the um, policing board looking at policing. You know, we're a very, very accountable organization, but it's very piecemeal. There's no sort of joined up writing. And I think we need some sort of joined up writing. But we need to absolutely put the needs of victims and survivors central to the whole thing. Uh, and if we don't do that, we risk you know, making a mess of things at, at our peril and having a situation where nobody is really involved or nobody is, is assessed. And I think it's about, and, and I know, uh, you know, I, I've seen uh, the CAJ's report on Anana there, who's, who's with us, I think, uh, in relation to memorialization and oral histories. And I think the oral histories that I thought were going to be a great way forward, and I believe are a very good way forward, the RUC George Cross, for example, has assembled about 350 oral mm. histories of police officers mm. uh, who served during the troubles of the conflict, or whatever it is you want to call it, uh, it, it which is an amazing repository of that sort of information. But the government seems to have also succeeded in weaponizing that. Mm. in some sort of a way, which mm. is making it uh, very unpopular and unpalatable by almost putting a stamp of, uh, you know, making it a government thing as opposed to, as I was talking about earlier on there, a ground up initiative. Of course. So it is difficult, uh, but we need to do something, mm. clearly need to do something, and uh, I'll just leave it at that probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, just to pick up on that point, and, you know, we had Colin Davidson's film yesterday. 18 portraits, 100,000 people visit the exhibition. They all take something away from it. Roger talks about 300 stories being stored within uh, the RUC George Cross Foundation. David told his story this morning in a, in a way that made us all listen. Uh, Kevin has just told his story. Uh, and very difficult to do so. But surely the place to imagine some better way of remembering what we've been through is outside that political frame. And yet I doubt the governments have had Colin Davidson inside a conversation to ask him, what was it about that exhibition which made 100,000 people visit it? Do, do you think, Una, there is a, a different way and a better way of doing this? I do, um, because what we're doing, what we've done, isn't working. Mm. 
Um, I don't think we need to <clears throat> overcomplicate it. I'll offer my view, which is I think the Eames-Bradley report is the way to do this. It was based on listening to lots of different people, which I think is something we struggle to do. You really hear people. We're very good at telling. We're not very good at hearing. And I think, you know, that as a vehicle for moving this on is, is a really good place to start. When I think about it in the context of policing, again, maybe I have the luxury of being and keeping things simple because I don't live here at the minute. Mm. But it strikes me that if you want to do policing well, my goodness, did we have a great platform for that in the pattern report? You could go the length and breadth of the world I would suggest and not find a more considered evidence-based approach to what good policing looks like. So I suppose my reflections on both are that we maybe need to stop intellectualizing it so much, politicizing it so much, and keep it simple. Complicating it so much. We yeah. are making something that's very, very difficult inherently more complicated. When actually, for me, when I certainly have gone to either the Memorial Garden for colleagues that were lost in the RUC or indeed Colin's exhibition, which I've been to a number of times now, the reason it resonates with me and I think the reason it resonates with hundreds of thousands of people is because it's telling a truth, it's speaking a truth and it's creating a space where you can really listen and really connect with people at an individual level, which sometimes I think we miss in some of the architecture that we put around these conversations in our place. So yeah, I think we have the vehicle, we just need to start doing it now. Yeah, thanks. You know, I'm just going to ask Neve and David to give us a final thought. And so, so can I just say one thing, you will never solve it through the courts or through justice. That's, I've said yesterday why, yeah. but I, we're running out of time, I'm 76. Mm. Most people I knew who were involved in the Troubles are dead. Mm -hmm. uh, I know five people who'd be willing to come forward in some sort of mediation process. One has died of cancer, one has Alzheimer's, that leaves three. Yeah. I know other people who know other people. Time is running out, that's yeah. all. I, I accept that point entirely, and I, when I look back to that period of the ceasefires and the political agreements, so much of the critical memory of that period is gone already. And the longer we wait, um, the more we lose. And I suppose that's maybe a, a point just to finish on, uh, Neve and, and David. Why is it that we can't find the way of doing this? Is it because we don't want to do it? Or is it because we're afraid of doing it? I think it's, it's human nature to shy away from what's very, very difficult. And there are a few things as, as difficult or impactful in, in a human perspective than legacy um, of conflict. Um, I think, again, in terms, I think the importance of safe space, Barney, and, and continuing the conversations. And, you know, I think a lot of events that we've all been to recently, one thing that's really struck me is this, again, this frustration, this disconnect between civil society and what's going on and, and kind of politics. Um, we've certainly, certainly found that perhaps, you know, political representatives and senior civil servants are, are more willing to engage in kind of a confidential way, kind of be behind closed doors. And I think that that, that has its place um, and can lead to something kind of transformative and, and something bigger in the public sphere. But coming back to that point that I think Una made earlier on around building trust, mm -hmm. building relationships, there's no short shortcut to that. Yeah. But that is something that I think has been lost a little bit or impacted quite negatively um, in recent years that we have to work really, really hard, all of us across this island and, and with, with our neighbours in Britain at, at redeveloping, at re-establishing. Keeping those conversations going. Absolutely, and building that trust. Of course, David. Um, several months ago, in fact, sometime last year, I was involved in several Zoom meetings with people from the NIO, and I made a comment uh, that uh, that the permanent secretary should encourage the secretary of state to go and see silent testimony because it was on again mm. at, uh, in the Ulster Museum. Um, and then I saw her some weeks or months later and she said, um, thank you for the suggestion to go and see silent testimony. I went to see it myself and it was very moving and, 
And I said to her, and I said, and did you manage to get the Secretary of State to go? Well, I'll leave you to guess what the answer was. Um, and I think that at the bottom line, or one of the, one of the elephant, elephants in the room perhaps, is, is, that, uh, is that politics is about politics. And uh, there are issues that um, politicians have to fight over, and victims sometimes get dragged in, and, and the consequence of the troubles gets dragged in as a, as a consequence of that. And, and that's not settled, and, and there are still used, political David. debates. They're used. Uh, quite so, yes. And as someone else has said, you know, when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. Um, so uh, we must just keep going on, and I think events like this are very helpful, and I will continue to kind of raise my small voice in my small corner wherever I can, and uh, many others uh, with similar stories will do the same. Um, and I think in time, um, uh, we will make some progress. I hope that the younger generation, uh, and the comments were made earlier today and, and yesterday as well about the next generation not really being interested in the troubles, and those, that troubles generation, and your comment about uh, you know, us letting go, uh, I, I have some sympathy with that, um, but my worry is that the younger generation coming up uh, don't really, they're not interested, and my fear is that then the cycle will be repeated. David, thank you. Neve, thank you. We're gonna have lunch and then we'll come back to this conversation immediately afterwards. Thank you very much.